boats and daisy chains can't seem to recall my true given name I see my footprints how they come how they go was that yesterday or only a moment ago my heart is gone Welcome to the social-engineer.org podcast number 85. Wow. 85. Yeah, 85. Can you believe it? 85 episodes. We're old. Good no, number. no. What are we going to do for the centennial one? The 100 and 15 more. So next year. We need to think of something particularly good for that. Though. I think so. Sure. I think it will have to be a really good one. Because that's almost Christmas time too, right? It'll be November, end of the year one. We'll have to figure out what we're doing in November. Usually we're crashing from the year of pain and suffering. I have ideas as to what we'll be saying, but I can't make that announcement. <laughs> we can't do that yet, Ping. I know. I'm holding back. You're holding back. Let's see if we can get Dave. Let's try again. We've been trying Dave for, for a while. Hi there. You reached David Kennedy with Trust a Second Binary Defense. <laughs> there we go. None of it so familiar. Now, please leave your name. Number. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Thanks for making yourself available, Dave. But he's also very chipper on his voicemail, which does make up for the lack of presence that that is true that is true oh wait 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 hark unto me there is a dave is it a dave or is it the sound of a dave? <laughs> the sound of a dave that's a scary sound if you think about it <laughs> well you know what the wonderful thing is because he will not be at his computer is there will be no bruce hornsby there'll be no hornsby i mean that is probably the best part of this podcast is he's on his phone I somehow yes. can't imagine he won't find a way to do something. Let us not encourage him or give him any ideas. <laughs> he probably has Bruce duct taped in his trunk or something. I should have daily affirmations from Ping, and it'll be the lack of Dave. <laughs> the lack is a of wonderful Dave. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's talk about what's going on before we get to our podcast. Okay, Michelle. Yes, sir. DEFCON just ended. I was going to ask, how did DEF CON go for you all? I missed you. It was really uh, ridiculous. I'm still recovering, actually. But it was the best year. It was the best year ever. Our room was packed nonstop. We had absolutely no no-shows. Every year, we, else, we always have at least one no-show, like someone who doesn't show up for the CTF. We had no no-shows. Everybody came. We had amazing speeches, packed rooms for speeches, actually up until 9 p.m. Room was just completely packed. So basically you're saying it was 3,600 square feet of nonstop social engineering fun for four days? For four days. There were still lines out to the elevator every single day. It was insane. Lines to the casino. We had the hotel coming in saying, you can't have your people blocking slot machines. Please wrap the lines around. At 7.30 in the morning, 7.30 in the morning, people were sitting outside the room. We don't even open till 10. 7.30 in the morning, people were sitting outside the room waiting to get in. So amazing, resounding success. I would applause, but that would be, you know, very annoying to do on the phone calls. But congratulations. Well done. However, Michelle needs to be sent on a nice vacation, a nice holiday. She's still recovering, but no one is sick. Michelle came back and took PTO two days after I stayed and worked. I took two days. I planned it out. I worked, so I think I need to be sent on a nice vacation somewhere. Did you have separation anxiety while she was resting and you were working? I did not. I had Hulk anxiety from the amount of work that we had that was due when we came back. <laughs> I have all first world problems. We have too much work, blah, 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 wine, wine, wine. Right. An entire, well, and I heard that everything went super well for you at Black Hat. I saw you at Black Hat and everything seemed to go, you're going super smooth in the class and everyone was raving about it. It was one of the best classes we ever taught. I mean, the students were thoroughly engaged. They were so dialed in. There was so much amazing interaction and questions and they didn't just accept standard answers. They made us really think and dig. It was really awesome. Yeah, really awesome. So they were really, were most of them practicing social engineers or pen no. testers at least? No. We had a small number of security folks and pen testers. 
a lot of people that work in the security departments of their companies, and then just some people who were there because they're professors or work in um, larger organizations and need to understand the threats and wanted to learn more about it. Awesome. Be the nicest thing about the oh no! Oh no! Wait, wait! How does this even happen? It's the curse of Dave. I was thought. I thought for a second Michelle was doing this to troll me, but then I looked and saw Dave's here. <laughs> Michelle would not have that music on any device she owns. You know, and I, I was just about to say that we need to thank our sponsors for DefCon, which is Fishline. Awesome. They always supported us for the last couple of years. Pindrop actually has been our longest standing uh, sponsor. And I was going to thank Trusted Sec. <laughs> but now you've been cursed. But then Hornsby made me fill with rage. <laughs> you know. Got, just, because, rage? <laughs> just because you're filled with rage doesn't mean you cannot say thank you, which you just did. But we can curse Dave. It's a good point. I guess rage shouldn't stop my thanks. Thank you very much for the defense. In the meantime, Michelle, let's talk about what's coming up. Let's see. You are speaking October 20th at the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing down in Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas, yes. Pretty exciting, actually, because um, it sounds like a really awesome event. And to have you representing there is pretty exciting for us. Actually, the day after October 21st, I'm in North Carolina, Raleigh, at the ISSA, 12th Annual InfoSec Con down there. And now classes. So we only have one left for this whole year, which is the Advanced OSINT class. And it's in Bristol, UK, in December 1st and 2nd. So if you want to be in that class, that's our last one for 16. But then we have our 17 schedule already online. So we have our APSE class, February 6th through 10 down in Orlando. Uh, really looking forward to that. Of course, the winter in Florida is always nice. We announced our MLSE. So if you're a past APSE student and you're listening to this and you didn't get the invite, let me know because it's online and we are almost sold out. Actually, we may be sold out by the time this comes out. I'm not even sure. We launched it 12 hours ago, and we already have nine out of 12 slots filled. Actually, I don't even think I could do Hornsby on this now because I'm on the... Perfect. This is the way you should do every podcast. No. June 5th through 7th, Advanced Practical Social Engineering in Bristol, UK. Now, uh, there are some other things that are happening in the meantime, like DerbyCon. That's right around the dang corner. Literally. No idea what that is. Yeah, well, it's a tiny con. No one's ever heard of it. We're supporting it, you know. So for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's tiny. It's in Louisville. It's actually uh, Louisville. Louisville. It's Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. That's how you say it. I can't say it the way they say it. Louisville with that weird thing that they do. Louisville. 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 Everybody knows what Derby Con is, and that is... I would say we have training there, which we do, but there's absolutely no seats left because we sold out like in three hours or something stupid like that. But that is September 21st and 22nd as a training. And then the actual con starts on the 23rd, 24th, and 25th. And I have some exciting news. We're actually running like a little mini SE village there. I'm excited about that. So excited. That is awesome. I'm glad you went when you did that. It was awesome, man. Yeah, I'm really, I am excited about it. We have our Mission SE Impossible, which is new and improved. We're doing some new things for Derby for that. And we're doing the polygraph challenge as we did last year. And we're going to have some other things set up in the room. So um, we'll be announcing that stuff on the website as we get it all ironed out with the Derby crew. And what other exciting things are happening at Derby? I'm sure there's more than just us. Oh, yeah. we got a ton of events. The Wu-Tang Clan is going to be there. We have a number of bands. Dual Core, obviously, will be there again this year. Hacker Jeopardy. We have a whole bunch of different events going on throughout the whole conference to keep everybody occupied. It's going to be a great time. You must be, like, dead tired, though, planning all of this. Dude, if you only knew. Like, my, my nights have been, like, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., you know, getting everything ready for the uh, the conference, getting scheduling up, and whole team's working in all cylinders. You're learning the value of hard work. No good things come without sacrifice, Dave. So we were sacrifice horns be to have a great podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Quite welcome. Thank you, Pink. Thank you, Pink, for being happy. <laughs> oh, man. I tell you, this just gets weirder and weirder every time. Well, Michelle, I think we should probably talk about the guest a little bit, right? Sure. Is this episode number 72? No, this is episode number 85. Okay, so 72. Got it. 
So <laughs> our guest is Professor Angela Zassi. She's an interesting researcher. She works for, as the director of UK Research Institute in Science of Cybersecurity uh, in the UK. And she's written a bunch of papers on human-centered aspects of security and identity and trust and different things like that. So reading her research, we thought she would make a pretty fascinating guest for us to have on the podcast. How are you today? I'm fine. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Maybe before we start, you could tell us a little bit about you and, and your research and, and where you're at so the listeners can get a little idea of, of who you are. So I'm a professor in the computer science department at UCL, and I've been there for a very long time now. Um, I started there about 25 years ago. Uh, but what's maybe quite quite different to a lot of other computer scientists is I started in psychology. So my, my bachelor's degree and my master's degree were in psychology, and I sort of like drifted over into computer science because I was really fascinated by how people interact with technology and why they often struggle to understand how technology actually works. And during the time at UCL, I sort of stumbled across security as one of the issues where that is definitely the case. People sort of really struggle to understand some of the security risks, but also that it's often impossible for them to follow the recommendations or the policies that experts set up. And so this is something I've been researching over the last 20 years, sort of like really looking at all aspects of human behavior and security, whether that is as employees and enterprises or as individual consumers or citizens trying to interact in this new digital age. So that seems like a pretty huge leap to start off with studying psychology and then to end up researching in, in security. So was there a particular event or something that occurred that made you start seriously looking at and thinking about security? It was indeed. My most cited paper is when I co-wrote with my then PhD student, Anne Adams. It's called Users Are Not the Enemy. And that was prompted by a phone call from a contact in a company who said, you know something about people, and I was working with them on something completely different, which was the, the first generation of, in fact, the kind of tools we're using now, of internet, um, audio, and video. And he said, you know something about people, right? Um, could you do a study and tell us why these stupid users can't remember their passwords. And this was in 1996. And so Anne Adams and I conducted a study. And at the end of it, I was just stunned by looking at sort of thinking, well, you know, really, there's just this massive gap between what people understand about the security risks on the one hand, but on the other hand, by what the security people think employees can actually reasonably do in the context of their normal work. And so that really sort of like got me on to the road of like getting more and more into security to the point that this is really all what I work on today, basically looking at how people interact with security and privacy and trust, which are really, really very closely related. That fills up my entire time now. You wrote that paper back in uh, 1999, right? That's right, yeah. What I find interesting about that is this is a, a philosophy that we hear often in this in our community, right? So in our industry, people even have T-shirts or bumper stickers or say something like there's no patch for human stupidity. It's something we often talk about here on the podcast because it's not really the way that we like to promote security because it's it's not about stupidity. It's about you know finding the right trigger at the right time that can make people fall for it. So what did your study find in the users are not the enemy? What was the result of it, the end of it? I think a part of it, so, so it found that, that people struggle to comply with the password regulations and that they ignored some of the policies because they didn't understand how some of the attacks work. But actually the latter part of it, that I think a lot of people who cite the paper don't seem to appreciate, was that the organization really made itself really vulnerable because it asked people to do something that wasn't humanly possible. And so in people's minds, you know, security becomes impossible, security people. So, you know, it's impossible. So why would I even start trying? 
And they're not really taking security seriously anymore. You know, if they don't actually think, if they find they can't do it, all of security really becomes impossible and a bit ridiculous in their hands. And we were arguing that this kind of, you know, the failure to actually work with people and get them on board was making the organization really vulnerable for that reason. You know, because if you want to effectively defend an organization, you need to to get everybody on board and everybody needs to understand what their specific responsibilities are. And you need to make sure they can actually discharge them. So that's back in 99. And you basically proved in your study that a lot of the problem is just policies. They're, they're giving people impossible things to accomplish. So they just take the easiest route possible. That's right. That's absolutely right. And I still sometimes I get a bit frustrated when I see that in many organizations that hasn't changed. So 20 years later, two decades later, after you published that study, have you actually seen a change or an increase in better security policies or better policies or just better education or communication with the employment population? Has there been any change, positive, negative, or do you feel it's still the same? In some organizations, it's still the same. I think the most, some of the more enlightened organizations basically have moved on. And I think also what we've seen is a lot of the organizations that were born digital, you know, so the, the big online businesses, I think they realized fairly early on that, that at least when it comes to customers, you know, you can't basically design security that, that is a business prevention. So when we look at the big organizations like Google and Amazon, you know, eBay, I think they're very aware that making security difficult for people to do would harm their business. And they basically take a lot more responsibility than a lot of organizations that weren't born digital and have more the the classic, you know, the traditional approach to it do. But one thing that really, you know, where finally, you know, we're seeing some change on a big scale is when in the organization that's responsible for setting security policies in the UK, that's GCHQ, or it's basically it's a part of GCHQ. Uh, called CSG, uh, that's responsible for us. They published a paper last year where they revised the advice they give about passwords. It's called Password Guidance Simplifying Your Approach. And they actually started to throw out a lot. They basically said, you know, a lot of what we think of as good security, such as having very strong passwords or expiring passwords, in reality, when you look at what that means for people, it's counterproductive. And really, organizations should step up take a lot more responsibility and deploy solutions that people really can use. So that's basically a change I was very happy about. That's interesting because one of our aspects of, of work is something called penetration testing, where we get to test an organization's security policies by trying to exploit their vulnerabilities, like breaking in. And we'll see companies oftentimes that have password policies that enforce changes often, like let's say every three months or six months and force a change, that the passwords end up being easier to guess because people will just add a digit to the end. It's like, you know, super secret password one, super secret password two, because they have to do this change and they realize that coming up with a, you know, 18 character upper lowercase um, special character password every three months is going to be impossible they come up with something easier and then just add a digit on the end and then write it somewhere, you know, write it on a, on a sticky note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. And we already saw that in those first studies and we pointed that out. It took, I think about six years ago. So, um, is it Zhang Mondros and Reiter actually published a paper, an empirical study, where they also showed that that exactly was the case. Um, they, they, they had a fairly large data set, and they showed there the more frequently the expiry was, um, the more predictable the password was. If you knew the old password, you could also, you know, you could work out what the new one was going to be. All of this is like for people in, in our industry, at least this is common discussion, but what's the fix? I mean, how does a company balance making security usable by non-technical users, but also making it hard for the hackers or the, the malicious hackers to break in? So I always challenge this notion of that there is a trade-off between 
making it easy for people to comply with security and you know the strength of security. I think it's a myth that strong security is difficult security. <laughs> we really have to knock this on the head because if security is difficult to do for the non-security experts in the organization, they still have to produce, they still have to get their job done, they still have to help the organization being profitable. And that's what they are focused on. And it's good that they're focused on that, you know, because an organization that is super secure but goes bankrupt isn't really of use to anyone. What we are advising to do is to, there's, there's really two strands you can do. So one is bring in some people or talk to people who know about job design, who know what's easy and what's difficult for people to do and don't implement security without consulting them on it. Because if you've got a particular sort of like risk management problem that you need to solve, if you don't talk to people who know what the primary job of employees is in the business process, then, you know, you can't really work out why it might conflict with the main job they have to do. So really starting that conversation, you know, and not not saying here is a, you know, here's a risk, here's a standard policy and pushing that out, but really looking at what that means for the different people who will have to comply with that policy in the context of the jobs they do. That is a really essential first step. It makes sense like with password use, but there's so many other aspects to security, like let's say physical security, right? Like there's some policies that we often hear, at least here in the States, like something like a a person must present a badge if they're going to get into the building. So, you know, they try to teach uh, employees about tailgating, you know, just because um, you're holding the door open for a bunch of people, you know, you have to make sure that the person's allowed in the building. But then you have these ploys that you'll hear will often work where someone is in the the uniform of the cleaning people, or they look like a fellow employee, or they're carrying a heavy box and, you know, and it's somebody you don't want to seem rude. So you hold the door open. Um, and what is your, your theory or your thoughts on, on how do we train those things? Because you don't want to make people lack compassion. Like you don't want your training to be, I don't care if the pregnant woman's carrying a heavy box, you know, you make her put it down and show you the badge. How do you blend letting people still be human, but following security policy that will keep the company safe. That's a really excellent example. In some of our own research in sort of in companies which are part of the critical national infrastructure, we discovered a couple of years ago that even though the general awareness of the risk amongst employees was very high and they were quite compliant themselves, there was a big reluctance to challenge other people. And there's a couple of aspects here that you can work on in order to improve on it. So first of all, is you need to to raise the awareness. So so very often they say like, well, I'm not going to challenge this person because it's not my job, right? That's security and it's not my job. So changing the awareness that with physical penetration in particular is that it is part of your responsibilities to if you don't intervene at that point in time, you know, the damage may immediately be done. So saying like, I'll email the security people that 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 may already be too late. The second part of it is that people really don't do it because most people lack the skill of how you do you challenge somebody in a way that is not, as you rightly said, rude or confrontational. And that is something that it doesn't take a lot of training, but it does take some training to show people how you say nicely, oh, you know, you've got a problem there is, and you know, it's really difficult to get through it and get your badge out as well. You know, if you clearly, if it's somebody you don't recognize and you don't know, is that you say in a nice way of, oh, but of course, you you know, you need to get the badge out in order to get through here. Or I mean, if somebody then says, oh, I don't have one, is that you point them to the, oh, these nice people over there at the reception desk can help you. Or who are you here to see? If you're basically going there, let me call, you know, if you just put the staff down, I will call the person for you and they can come and sort out your, your access credentials, that kind of thing. It kind of comes back to something that we've promoted for years, which is uh, like our motto is security through education, because what we find in our practice, too, is is similar to what you're saying. 
a lot of people don't know how to defend against an attack because they don't even know what the attack is or that it exists. If they don't know what vishing is or smishing or fishing, then they can't possibly protect against it. So you have to first start with good quality awareness education within a company, followed up by actionable policies, followed up by more education to tell them what to do when something that can cause a breach occurs. Is that kind of what you're finding also? Yeah, you can look at that in two ways. So to some extent is if you're making it easy for people to to follow, to deploy the behavior that you want, the correct, the secure behavior, if it's easy to do, do they necessarily have to be aware of all the risks? No, not always. If the behavior is easy to do and people do it routinely and automatically, the question would be, it's like, you know, how much do they really need to know? Does every employee really need to know about every single possible attack? From a job design point of view and from an efficiency point of view, is it really, do you need to turn everybody into a security expert? That's something that companies really need to ask themselves, you know, and working out, you know, which knowledge and which skills are required in different parts of the organizations generally, I think, is more efficient rather than pushing all the risk information at everybody. If you work in a particular area where specific attacks are likely to occur, and I think arguably where I would agree with you is these days, if you have certain access credentials, you work on certain parts of the IT if you are connected in any way to the payment systems or the credentialing systems or whatever, then yes, a broader knowledge of the different types of attacks and how they can be done is probably required because, you know, a lot of these attacks are, are constantly evolving. They are new. And so, you know, basically the, the reality is, you know, there, there are a lot of there are clever people out there who are attacking the organization. They're constantly evolving, trying different things. And so that general kind of awareness is for certain roles. I think, yes, it is required. So <clears throat> have you found particular types of training to be more efficient than others? It's my job to be professionally skeptical about training. And first of all, it's like always, you know, if you're just putting in training rather than designing good, efficient security mechanisms and policies, then I'm going like, no, that's not what it's for. Um, security training and awareness is really there to give people skills um, that they do need and, and that they don't have. If you want people to really engage with the training, it's not sort of like something you push down to individuals. If you want people to really be engaged and in this way be part of it, it's a social activity, right? And that has to be part of the general discourse, what we call discourse. It's the conversations that happen within the company on a day-to-day -day basis. If you have an organization that's really, really good and well defended, what you find is that the security is part of the overall conversation that is happening. That to me is as important as training that you give to individuals to deploy skills. It's really amazing. If you find is, if it's part of the general conversation, people are aware and people, you know, they have, they develop little antennas and they ask each other and they go like, hmm, do you think this is a bit weird or funny or have you seen this one before? And I think that is a hallmark of an organization that, uh, where the defenses are working. Oh, I have to agree with you because I found that I've been instrumental in deploying the internal security awareness program at my company. And really what I call it, it's a security-minded culture. And when I first came on board, I was like, we have all this stuff and you're trying to have everyone drink from the fire hose. But I said, not everyone uses this particular tool. So asking everyone to use like a password vault, which for the most part is standard good security practice, right? Here in the US anyway. But half the people in this company won't need to use a password vault because they only need to have one password and it's just to access their email. But so, you know, it's like, why are we asking everyone and advising everyone to use a password vault? Because now we're getting questions. Oh, where is this vault? How do I use it? And really only certain people needed to utilize that particular kind of technology. So your position actually on how the training has to be relevant or else it's completely useless, right? If it's not relevant to their job or the things that they're touching every day. I also have to agree that over time, since we've tried to, I don't, I'm not going to say it's role-based training, but training that's more relevant to their jobs, that they will have actual social discourse. They'll talk amongst themselves on their team 
and say, well, does this look funny? Is this right? Is this wrong? Maybe we should put a query into IT or the information security group. So I found that to be very effective. And I know that there's been a lot of frustration expressed by clients that I've talked to who are like, we bought all these widgets, you know, this training and this testing and these tools, everyone doesn't want to use it. And they're complaining that it's useless and it's a waste of their time. And and then you start to get into the cultural assessment, right? And you're like, well, why would you ask them to, you know, worry about things like workplace hygiene when everybody's working from home, right? So asking them to lock away their passwords and lock up their, you know, laptop in their desks, you know, or in a filing cabinet. I'm like, well, everyone's working from home. So they're not moving their machines around and they're not leaving an office space. So yes, for those people, they felt, wow, that was a waste of my time. I can't get that time back. I could have been doing something differently. And then every following subsequent educational piece that you try to give them, there's more resistance to it, right? Because they've already gotten a bad reaction to the initial set of training they've received. But I think that those changes are hard to come by and they're slow to institute as well. I agree with you. I mean, that really is is also the observations that that we found. That's why it is really so important. I think really the, the step to get always ask the question of like, does it work? Can this security measure work in the context that we're doing? And and not, you know, basically you have a limited, we call it the compliance budget. It's one of the papers that we wrote, you know, that people actually have a very acute sense of whether they are productive or not productive enough. And if you see too much of their time and energy being drained by something that they don't see as directly contributing to our productivity, they will without unconsciously, without thinking too much, they will sort of then that's when they fall off the wagon and they're looking for ways around. And a lot of organizations, I think, because, say, the people who run the business don't really engage with security, they are tacitly complicit. You know, if you then ask the manager, well, you know, shall I follow the security policy or shall I reel this client in? <laughs> the manager says, oh, yeah, just this once, right? You know, shortcut the policy and things. But that's how the rot, of course, sets in. It would seem like that maybe, and I don't know if you have any studies that you did on this, but that CBT-based training is not very effective. Absolutely. It's in our some of our own studies, but also very big reports so of the Information Security Forum published a report at the beginning of 2014, where which concluded is, you know, this kind of training, they canvassed 100 of their members, I think, member organizations, and they're very big ones. And the vast majority said it's not effective. And they said, you know, it's just background noise. Really. <laughs> I think this is part of the, the problem that the companies are trying to cut costs and they think training You know, it's cheap to do computer-based training, but people don't. I mean, there there can be if the training is very well designed and it's part of an overall proper campaign and a a well-designed communication and an approach that there can be. But the standard one that the companies are just looking for a cheap, quick way of doing education by computer-based training, that really doesn't work. And I think what we've also found, too, is that with the populations that we work with, if we are able to bring security issues to a very personal level, it becomes much more relevant because obviously if you are unsafe at work and you have any practice, you know, you, you have unsafe practices, you do things that can put your company at risk. It is likely that you're making those same kinds of decisions at home too and vice versa. So I think the main message for us oftentimes when we work with our clients is that this is not just a skill that you learn to do your job well. This is a skill that you learn that will affect your entire life. And I think if companies are able to convey that sort of personalized messaging and and make those skills that one learns at work relevant in all aspects of life, there's a much greater chance of success in terms of people really being behind that sort of training and and being more interested and involved and engaged in what they have to learn. I don't know if you have any experience with that. No, it's very clear that people in general, we have catching up to do and that a lot of people don't have the right skills for the digital age. And that's how we should market them. You know, that these are skills for being a consumer, a citizen and an employee in the 21st century. Yes, certainly. I mean, you're going to be fished at work and you will certainly be fished at home. So if those skills are transferable and um, employees understand that, I think it does make it a little bit easier on the side of security to ensure that proper and relevant training is being conducted, as you said. 
That's right. But I think we also need, is still also a lot of catching up to do, that those people who basically design and deploy systems and services Absolutely. really need, need to secure them, <laughs> you need to really think about security from the beginning and put in security solutions that make it possible and not unduly complicated or time-consuming for people to do the right thing. Those two things have to go hand in hand. I think what we don't want is, I've seen some campaigns which are really bad in the sense that they just scare people. You know, people who who really are are acutely aware that they may be lacking skills. You know, you just push them out of the digital sphere if all you do is scaring them and then have to have unrealistic demands in terms of what those skills are. I think we want people to be able to, to transact online security. And yes, there are some things they have to do, but there's also things that the service providers and the people who, who, who own the systems and run the systems need to do. And sometimes I've seen a lovely example um, in Germany, the German banking sector, they get together the, the IT people there and the security people get of all the banks get together with telcos and with law enforcement people, the prosecutors and so on once a year and basically discuss, you know, what what are the the attacks that are emerging, how they're countering them, what they found is working is not. They found that a lot of attacks on older people, for instance, are run via phone. It's the vishing you mentioned earlier, right? And they looked at, you know, what the scam typically looks like and who the typical victim is. And they decided that in the case of some of these older people, that really, you know, trying to get the awareness out to them wasn't realistic. A lot of them don't actually engage with some of the media. And so they basically said, okay, in this case, what we need to do is train our staff. You know, so they weren't even using online banking, but they would go into banks or post offices and these older people would make suddenly make a transfer and transfer a bunch of money abroad, right? To and they said, Well, frankly, the only thing we can do is train the staff and for law enforcement to have a response. And so if an older person in Germany goes into the post office or into the bank and suddenly wants to transfer some money abroad, which I've never done before, the staff have been trained to say, I'm sorry, the machine for transferring money abroad is broken. Could you please come back tomorrow? And they will basically then call the officer, the local officer, who basically deals with those kind of frauds and scams. And he will then explain, you know, contact the person and explain, ask them, what has happened, and then explain to them why this is a scam and so on. People are going to think that we had a setup with you because you're like, you say all the things we've been saying for years. Michelle and I, we work together in the same company and our philosophies always like if the training takes more than 90 seconds at, at the moment when you're introducing it to the employee, they're probably going to shut down and move on and consider it a burden more than, than anything else. So we try to do short bursts of training you know, like for phishing emails or something like that, something that they can consume in a couple minutes or under. And that way it's not really interrupting their day and taking time away from their life, but it's a constant reminder of what to do, you know, where how to report fish and making it, like you said, easier for them to do the right thing, putting the right thing in front of them constantly. So the other example I have, which is wonderful, is that um, with phishing training, so, so some of the toughest customers are, of course, people who are very valuable to an organization because they make the organization a lot of money, for instance. And so in the financial industry, traders are a notoriously difficult audience when it comes to following security measures and, and paying attention to training. And so the CIO of the London Bank basically told me that he finally got a, a meaningful, you know, sort of like clicking on links to disappear when he, instead of basically sending out messages and telling people about the various kind of and how to check an email, he made it really, he said, I'm going to make it really easy for you. Look at the email and if you're not sure, if you're not 100% sure, it's genuine, it's legit. Um, click on this button. I'm not sure. <laughs> and then um, the security department will get back to you and tell you. And he said, suddenly he got kaboom, he got a massive reduction in the number of clicks on suspicious emails. And they then started to develop that. And he said, and that also is, you know, you get back to people then and say, yes, this is legit or it's not legit because, and you explain to them. And then they started to put that on a web page. It's a daily update now. And that's basically what you were saying. 
you know, people are actually not uninterested and they're also interested in protecting themselves at home. And so if that information is available in a format they can understand and that's easy to consume and accommodate within their work, they will do it. And he now said, like, you know, people really looking at, at that web page and are discussing the latest scam with each other, which also means, you know, it's part of the discourse. It's, you know, and that really promotes awareness and an interest in a way that isn't ramming it down people's throats. Yeah, excellent. It's very validating. It's exactly what we do with our customers and clients. So it's kind of nice to hear it from a researcher point of view as things that work. The other thing that I like that Angela said is is how the fear based testing isn't as effective, you know, and that's something that that we employ with our company as well. We we feel very strongly that if you terrify a population during training or or enrage them, you really do lose the opportunity to get the maximum amount of training and education, you know, just good habits that you want to sink in if they're too busy being spending energy being angry at you and the security team for having put them through that sort of exercise. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, with the habits, I, I could also point out, it's one one of the other things we did recently is we worked with colleagues from HP Enterprise and created a business-wide paper, which is where we say awareness is only the first step. And we talk about like, if you're transforming existing habits that people have, bad habits, it's a non-trivial process, you know, and the company really needs to be prepared to support them through that process of changing from highly learned routine behavior, even if it's a bad habit, it's a highly routine behavior. And going through the process of replacing that is, it is some effort and we should acknowledge that it is some effort and support people through that process. Once the new habit is bedded in and automatic, it's not a problem anymore. But a lot of people fall off the wagon when they encounter some difficulties and no support in doing that process of replacing one habit with another. This is another really valuable point, I think. It has to be consistent. I don't think anyone's impervious to this. I tell this story often. Last year, as a company, uh, as part of our educational, uh, for our clients, educational policies, we sent three and a half million phishing emails. And Michelle and I co-wrote a book on phishing. And I clicked on an actual fish last year because it was the right trigger at the right time at the right moment. I fell for it. You know, I, I tell people this all the time to say, like, this is not a all of a sudden a moment in time where you just become fish proof or you're impervious to attack because you've reached this, you know, level of understanding. So I, I think the consistency is a big part, like you said. Otherwise, when a new attack comes up, if you're not consistently training people, then they're not going to know what to do and they're going to rely on old habits. That old habit may be an insecure one. So it's important to consistently do this positive and effective training. Exactly. And really help replace those those habits uh, with secure ones. And I think this is actually one of the biggest challenges we face right now is without scaring people too much and without making everyone hugely inefficient to basically say, it's okay to stop and think for a minute, right? I mean, basically understanding that attackers are trying to push your buttons and, and make you react, you know, make you do something really quickly. And often they, you know, they're panicking you into doing something. They leverage like authority, you know, if you look at the CEO scams, right, for instance, you know, they're basically trying to use authority to scare somebody into doing something. It, it has to be all right for an employee to get it wrong as well. And they should never be punished or made fun of because they sort of like stopped and thought for a bit and then asked somebody else for, for reassurance. You know, that has to be perfectly okay to do. We find um, the same thing that if if we have positive reinforcement as opposed to negative, so like rewarding those who did the right thing, that works so much better than shaming. We actually have a part of our contracts when we work with companies that states not firing people for falling for the things that we will do because, you know, eventually if it was, let's say Michelle and she got fired, well, the next human you hire is going to be just as vulnerable. So there's no sense in firing people. Let's educate them and, and make them better as opposed to getting rid of them. Yeah, that's absolutely the right thing to do. And I think we could get a bit more creative in how we reward people. 
basically so so a combination of reward um but with a sort of like where where not not getting the reward is almost a punishment it's like so key performance to to make it part of the overall review you know if it's really important to be secure in your organization then um and, and basically that you've completed your training and that you know the key behaviors they should be part of the key performance indicators but also rewarding, giving prizes to departments who do particularly well, you know, on certain aspects who've managed to improve hugely on certain, you know, aspects of the performance, of the security performance. So if we look at, you know, in, in, mo- in a lot of organization, access control is a bit um, logical access control. Access to IT systems can be a bit of a car crash in a department where they were doing a lot of work around, you know, sharing passwords or keeping old accounts sort of like just in case as quick workarounds to get the things that we've got to have this, you know, as a proper audit trail and everything. So if they've managed to improve, then why not give them a reward for doing that? And as you said, I think to see it to be a positive thing and achieving things in security, that should be positive and should be rewarded. You know, at the end of the day, what I find is when people break security rules, you don't see them standing there and cheering like, oh, you know, I broke the rules and I got away with it. They're actually sort of like going like they're not comfortable. They're not happy about the fact that they're doing it. And there's always at the back of, you know, this worry and the nagging doubt at the back of the mind in itself is something that's a cost to people. And if you take that away, right, if you're actually knowing you're doing the right thing, That is in itself quite rewarding and positive. But we can add to that also that if people have really made an effort and improved, responded well and cleaned up something that was a particular area, I think that should also be acknowledged and celebrated. And that in itself then becomes, you know, it sort of feeds forward into a more positive perception of security and getting people to see it's something we can do. It's actually possible. That is sort of like a self-reinforcing positive cycle. Angel, this is uh, fascinating. I really, really appreciate all of your thoughts and especially your research. This will be something that we'll be referring to often. If if our listeners wanted to find out more about you, where where's the best place or how's the best place to interact with you or find about your research or things like that? You can go to the website of the Research Institute in Science of Cybersecurity, which is www.risks.org, risks with a C. Uh, and that's a public website there. So the two papers I mentioned, the white paper on security awareness and the password guidance papers are linked from there. And also the papers we've published as part of our project over the last four years are all available from there. Okay, excellent. So we'll put that in the show notes. And one of the things we always ask our guests when they come on is we have a lot of avid readers that listen to the podcast. Uh, It doesn't have to be about this particular topic, but are there any great books that you've read or that you would recommend for people who really enjoy to read? I I have found this understanding trust from a social science and economics point of view is really, really helpful in this space. I've found something that's, that's maybe slightly left field, but hugely entertaining, very good science, but hugely entertaining is a book called Trust Signals of the Mafia by a social science re- researcher called Diego Gambetta. It's absolutely fascinating. It gives a very good introduction to how trust, to trust is and how it works. But of course, as security people, we also like to understand attackers and how they work. And I think it's actually, it's one of the books that gives you some quite good insights on how you can start leveraging an understanding of trust against the attackers. I'm going to write that down and put that in the show notes. So trust signals of the mafia. Awesome. Excellent. So I can't thank you enough. This has uh, been a really uh, fascinating podcast. Very interesting for us to hear from a research point of view, a lot of the things that we've been kind of promoting and talking about here now and in, in, um, done in research and proven. So it's really validating. We, we appreciate that very much. Yeah, you know, and what's uh, starting to get exciting is it seems like all the people who um, pretty much know what they're talking about, we're, we're all coming to the same conclusion about, you know, security and how to treat your populations and how to train them. I mean, it's, it's good stuff, man. What was encouraging for me was that it's um, a person who didn't start off in security or even computers technology and was just studying psychology and then after years of research 
uh, have come to the conclusions that we have after years of doing the work and doing it the, both the wrong way and then the right way. And here we are meeting at this, this, this crossroads, this pinnacle and saying, yeah, you know what? CBTs aren't effective all the time unless you mix it with actual other training and shaming your people. Yeah, that, that stinks and it doesn't work. It's kind of really, really great to see that. I have this, uh, great white paper she just told us about before, uh, we said our goodbyes and it actually talks about the ineffectiveness of CBTs when they're just standalone. So I think we're going to do a nice blog post on that. That would be, that would be a great one for the dot com. Oh, well, we lost everybody. Dave was here for like five minutes and then he dropped. Ping stuck it out much longer, but she was in a car driving through the wilderness. So she dropped. So it's uh, just you and me as usual. <laughs> it seems to be the motto, the SE podcast motto, Michelle and I. Just the two of us. And, and fortunately, nobody's stabbing sharp objects into you, uh, this podcast. So that makes me happy. <laughs> People seem to really like that. Yeah, yeah, they're still talking about it. It's been like three weeks, and they're still talking about you getting stabbed with sharp objects live on the podcast. Yeah, I'm actually recovering nicely, and I just want to let you know that I tweeted out today. I'm, I'm looking for suggestions on what to program in my NFC tag. So any of you that have brilliant ideas, I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> oh, this is going to get fun. Okay, so the, <laughs> the hashtag is Sultry Cyborg. If you're interested in playing along, that's the hashtag, Sultry Cyborg. And, uh, yeah, send us, tweet your ideas to, um, at Sultry Asian. And, um, we'd love to see what kind of things you come up with that we should program Michelle. Uh, the first suggestion I have is just go straight for the Rick roll. I like that oh, one too. Oh man, Rick. Oh, <laughs> you know, or man, could it be that you like every time Hornsby is heard or something, it does something like, I don't know, shock Dave. Is that possible? Can you do that? <laughs> I think we can look into it. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be my suggestion. And Dave's not here to defend himself, so can't argue. Um, okay, well, you know how to get a hold of us. It's uh, uh, social-engineer.org, or the corporate site is social-engineer.com. We have our Twitter accounts, which is Human Hacker for me, Sultry Asian for Michelle. Our corporate is SOC Engineer Inc. You, of course, can follow Dave at Hacking Dave and Ping at Valkyrie if you would like to. Uh, follow all of us. That would be fine, too. If you're still on the IRC network, it's irc.freenode.net channel social dash engineer. I guess that's about all for now. So until next time, see you. footprints how they come how they go was that only a moment or many years ago my heart is gone